scriptures from 2 Timothy chapter 3 verses 16 and 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Good morning. Have you ever had a verse in your head and you had it down and you thought you knew exactly what it said and then you went and looked it up and it didn't say that at all? You ever do that? You, you, or you get a slogan in your head, you get some sentence and when you go to actually say it, you know, you make sure and check with the original. It's not close to what you think it said. I did that with Second Peter. I, I was so convinced that Second Peter told us to be ready to give a defense, an answer and I'd always said, you know, that's, you know, because I know the Bible and that's why I'm ready to give an answer. And that's not what it said. I was a little upset, actually. It said, be ready to give an answer for the hope. Did you notice that? It didn't say for all the Bible knowledge you could have. It said for the hope. Now, at what point do we get that hope? Do we get the hope after we've been a Christian 20 years, 40, 60, 90, 80? Or is that one of those things that just comes with Jesus? So, when I was thinking about this, it appears as though we're going backwards, but we're not. We're in that same series on the Word of God. And I said the very first thing I want to talk to you about is sharing the Word of God. And it seems to most of us, well, no, we need to go learn, we need to go study, we need to go study. But if, if you share Jesus and all you say is, I have hope because of Jesus... Well, you've shared the hope. You've given a reason for the hope that is in you if you say Jesus. And most of our kindergarten teachers are pretty good at this. Jesus. And when we come to God, we have to realize that we begin with sharing the word of God because we are not going to be ready. To know everything so that we can share everything. We share only that we have hope. Today we are in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And we're going to be talking about applying the word. And again, it's the same concept. Aren't I getting out of order? Because our first lesson is sharing the word of God. The second lesson is applying the word of God. The third lesson we will get to is seeking the word of God. Seeking to know more of the word of God. And so often we think once we've got it all figured out, once we've learned everything in the Bible, we'll try to apply it. It doesn't. It doesn't work. The only way it really works is if we say, I know some. Let me apply some. Let me apply what I know. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, starting in verse 1. For I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that our fathers were all under the cloud and all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And all ate the same spiritual food, and all drank the same spiritual drink. For they were drinking from a spiritual rock, which followed them, and the rock was Christ. Nevertheless, with most of them God was not well pleased, for they were laid low in the wilderness. Now these things happened as examples for us. Now these things happened as examples for us. I always, I always miss my spot on this. Now, these things happened as an example for us so that we would not crave evil things as they also craved. Do not be adulterous as some of them were. As is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and stood up to play. Nor let us act immorally as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in one day. Nor let us try the Lord as some of them did and were destroyed by the serpents. Nor grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now these things happened to them as an example. And they were written for our instruction. Our instruction. Upon whom the ends of the ages have come. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. I, I love repeating that because this is written for us. 
We always look at those Old Testament stories and go, they're cute stories. You know, they're not cute stories. We don't go Noah's Ark, beautiful rainbow. We go Noah's Ark, people dead. Everyone dies, stinks, smells, stinks up to heaven. That's the Bible story. And we look at that and we go, oh, cute Bible story. We can learn a lesson. And we need to look at it this way and say, that was written for us. That was written for our instruction. That was written so that we would be changed. He says, take heed lest ye fall. I know I'm quoting the King James, but I love the way they say it. Take heed lest ye fall. Be careful because you can fall. Lest you think you stand so securely on your own merit that you fall. And he talks about all these people who fell in the Old Testament and says that was only written down for you. He doesn't say it was written for all time. He says those that live now at this end of the age where we have the church in its full power, the kingdom has come. And God tells us it is written for that age, the age that we're in. Not a book where he writes us and he says, you know, some of this applies, some of it don't, some of it throw out. Try to figure out what's what. But instead, he says, this is actually written to you. This is our age, the church age, as you might call it. It is written to us. And he challenges us to be changed by what we learn. The Bible wasn't contained in a giant book when they got it. You didn't have the New Testament book. You had letters. And you think about it, he couldn't have said this without knowing that they were looking at letters. When you got the book of 1 Corinthians, you didn't go, oh, I got to wait till I get the book of Romans and I got to wait till I get the book of Ephesians. He said, here's 1 Corinthians, learn it, apply it. And take what you already know and apply it to our lives, lest we fall. Because all these things were written down for our instruction. But not only does he tell us to change and then just leave us to our own, he empowers us to change. Verse 13. No temptation. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man and God is faithful. Who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will provide the way of escape. So that you will be able to endure it. Therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. I speak as to wise men. You judge what I say. Is not the cup of blessing which we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Is not the bread which we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one body, we who are many are one body. For we all partake of the one bread. Look at the nation of Israel. Are not those who eat the sacrifices shares in the altar? What do I mean then? That a thing sacrificed to idols is anything? Or that an idol is anything? No. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. I do not want you to become shares in demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You cannot partake of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Or do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? We are not stronger than he, are we? Did you notice he begins, he says, do the right thing. And then he says, God didn't leave you to do it alone. He says, God is going to provide a way of escape. There will always be an escape supplied by him. Nobody said you would like the escape though. Nobody said you would enjoy the escape that he offered you. It does not say in this phrase that that escape is the most beautiful, well-lit way and perfect for everything. But he does say he will not tempt you beyond what you're able. He will not allow Satan to attack you more than you can possibly take. And it doesn't say you are faithful, you can endure. You are faithful, you can be like Christ. You are faithful, you can be great. It says God is faithful. And all of this, it tells us to flee idolatry. It tells us to flee, flee, flee. That's the only real phrase we get. And it doesn't talk about our greatness. It talks about God's greatness. 
And too often we look at our, the sin in our life and what the Word has taught us, and we're convinced that we're not good enough. And the great point is, you're right. We're not good enough to apply the Word of God. We're not good enough to live out the Word of God. We are not faithful enough. We don't have the faith to do the things that God calls us to do. When they came to Christ, they didn't say, I have the faith, do this, Lord. They said, help my unbelief. And it doesn't say, man is faithful, he can be righteous before God. It says, God is faithful. And instead of looking at this and once again starting our reverse thing, where we go, once I know the word, all of it, then I can apply it, then I can share it. We do the complete opposite. We share the hope that we have. Jesus. We then take the word that we know, and we may be wrong at times. We may have stuff confused. I may be confused with what 2 Peter said. And that's okay. Because I apply what I know, and God is faithful. And he empowers us as one body. One body that shares in the body and the blood of Christ. That shares in the power of the Holy Spirit. That shares in the blessings of God. All of those promised in baptism. And he continues. With this challenge to apply everything that we have received. Verse 23. All things are lawful. But not all things are profitable. All things are lawful, but not all things edify. Let no one seek his own good, but that of his neighbor. Eat anything that is sold in the market without asking any questions for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and all it contains. If one of the other believers invites you and you want to go, Eat anything that is set before you without asking questions for conscience sake. But if anyone says to you, this is meat sacrificed to idols, do not eat it. For the sake of the one who informed you and for conscience sake, I mean not your own conscience, but the other man's. For why is my freedom judged by another's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I slandered concerning that for which I give thanks? Whatever then you eat or drink or whatever you do, whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense either to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I also please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of the many so that they may be saved. The other day I was listening to this great evangelist and he said, once your life is authentic, people will want to know about Jesus. Here's a great one. Let me tell you the story of Jesus. This is what they thought of Jesus. They said he was a blasphemer. Well, that's really authentic. They thought he was a drunk. That's really authentic. And they thought he was a glutton. That's really authentic. People are not going to think you're authentic if you're authentic. We know this because if anybody was authentic, Jesus. We will never be as good as Jesus. And yet we think that once we are fully authentic, we've got the whole word applied. We've got it all perfect. No one's going to call us a hypocrite now. We're safe from the H word. We're safe. We, we, we got it. We're, we're just like Jesus. We're, we're safe from that H word. He wasn't. He's teaching about the power of God and how God came to save them, how great God is. And all they're saying to him is, you work for the devil. And once we apply the word of God, once we apply it, it no longer becomes a matter of law anymore. Did you notice he said nothing is unlawful? 
Those who want to make the New Testament a law have a problem here. The law's gone. But, but if the law is something that Christ brings in and he says, I bring in a new and better way. I preach to you a new commandment. Not that it's new. You've already heard it. But it's new. And he tells us to love. And we look at this situation. And do we even need him to say, if you go to the temple and it bothers your brother. Or it bothers an unbeliever. Love them. Love them enough not to cause them to stumble. We're not talking about authentic as in perfect. We're talking about authentic as in trying. As in if I do something and it bothers my brother, I'm not doing it around them. If I have a brother who says I shouldn't eat too much at Thanksgiving, hmm, okay, see, now I've I'm, I'm got you. Then I go to him and I eat vegetables. I won't overeat those. I'm good. I'm going to stick with my carrot or whatever else is a vegetable. And I, I love my brother enough to do whatever is necessary to save. I do what is necessary to maintain an authentic presence. And sometimes, guess what? It's going to be different. He doesn't say, never eat meat sacrificed to an idol. He says, if you do, and somebody has a problem with it, don't do it. So it... Let, let me explain what a hypocrite is. It's somebody who does something here, doesn't do it here, and switches back and forth. Think of a politician. You've got two sides in your mouth. They talk out both. Right? You say it here one way, you say it here another. That's a hypocrite. Right? This word we're so afraid of. And we shouldn't be. Because we claim to be children of God. We claim to be God's Children, we claim to be his messengers. We claim to speak for him. We claim to share the message that is so great that we can't even figure it out. We talk about a God we can't understand. If so, if you have God completely understand, please help me with the Trinity a little bit. Please help me get all those little nuances down because I can't really figure out all that. I talk to you about something I don't completely understand. The Bible uses the word mystery. What? You're going to tell me something and you don't even get it. You're a hypocrite. I'm trying to look at all of y'all and I'll call y'all a hypocrite at once, but it's a short word. Hypocrite. Right? We are hypocrite because we don't have it all down. We're telling people to live after a book and we haven't got it all down yet. And he just says, do everything you do. God is faithful. God is perfect. Serve him. Us terrible mess ups, let's serve him. You know, let's, let's make mistakes, but serve him. Let's disagree on stuff and serve him. Let's teach about stuff that is so great that it's called a mystery. And still consider it a mystery. And at the end of the day, say, God, I love you. You are my power. You sent your Holy Spirit. It is your Holy Spirit that was given to me, promised to me. Repent and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. I like how I didn't say you might. There's no mites in the Bible. There is you will. There is this pouring out of God and us being the junk that we are. Could you imagine it, though? You, you, you have a beautiful Thanksgiving dinner, right? You make that turkey thing that looks all purty. It's shiny on the outside, right? You glaze it with Crisco, I think, right? <laughs> Makes it extra tasty, right? You got this perfect turkey, right? And then you find this nasty trash can, right? Don't even wash it out. It's, it's pretty rough, right? And you just, you set it neatly in the bottom so that it's safe. Because when God built a temple in the Old Testament, he built this beautiful temple. It had carvings on everything. It was purple. Everybody knows purple is the best. 
and it had stone and it was exact measurements and everything was perfect and it was gold and it was precious stones and that was God's temple and then he took this beautiful temple and he replaced it with this nasty little trash can of meat he replaced it with me God put his Holy Spirit in something as fallible as us. Something as fallen as us. Who he doesn't say, now that I've got you, you're going to be so perfect. You, no one will ever throw trash in you. You will never seek trash again. But God says, take your nasty little trash can and serve me. Serve me. Take, take that beautiful turkey, that Holy Spirit that's in you. Give it out. Give out this beautiful turkey that is inside this nasty trash can. Because we may not be doctors, right? But if somebody's got a cut, we're going to offer them a band-aid. We may not have the word perfectly down. We may not know everything. And people may not see us as authentically living out Christianity. And God didn't command us to do that. He commanded us to apply what we know. He commanded us to strive for, for strive for perfection. To strive to be like him. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. That striving, that effort where God is faithful and we just put forth effort. And we don't present a nasty trash can as anything more than that, but it's all God intended. Because God has better messengers than us. He does. We know about this. We read them in the Bible. When they show up, people fall down in fear. He's got angels. He doesn't need anything. But he wants to take us because he loves us, because we matter to him. And he wants us to apply what we know and love others so that they may be saved. 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 8. For I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. And the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. Apply his word now. And if all you know of his word is that Jesus came, he died for our sins. He was raised, overcoming death and sin. If that's all you know, that's a great place to start. Having faith that Jesus did just that. Confessing Jesus as Lord, repenting of our sins and giving them up to God, being buried with Christ in baptism so that we go through his death, burial, and resurrection, so that we can then live for him and we can end just like Paul gets to. The time of my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. In the future, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. That is what we leave an invitation of, is waiting for that day. 
where we don't fear the departure, but we wait for that departure where we receive our crown. If there's anybody who needs prayers or wishes to submit to the eldership here, we ask that you come now as we stand and as we sing.